Okay, so today we have with us Angie Atkinson. Hi, Angie. Hello, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And I have a handful of questions for her. But before we get into that, Angie, please tell us a little bit about kind of how people can find you. We'll start with that. How can people find you? Your website, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Okay. So my website is queenbeing.com and that's where you can find just about everything. But you can also go to narcissisticabuserecovery.online or booksangiewrote.com will take you to my Amazon page. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Coach Angie Atkinson or Twitter or YouTube at Angie Atkinson. So youtube.com slash Angie Atkinson. Wonderful. Okay. And if you guys didn't catch all that, I will link to it down below. So just FYI. So Angie, can you tell us a little bit about how did you get involved in speaking on all of this? So I'm kind of a nerd by nature and I was a journal <laughs> and I was a journalist by trade. So when something happens to me in life or something interests me and I need to figure it out, I just start researching. Well, I do that because I need to figure it out and understand it like on a logical level. You know what I'm saying? It's just my nature. So I tend to then write about it because that helps me kind of firm it all up in my head. It's how I get through stuff. So I was blogging and I was writing books about all these different things I was interested in back in the um, mid 2000s. (laughs) And uh, so my blog kind of led me there because I recognized that there was a very significant person in my life, a parent, who was a narcissist after a seriously major betrayal. And so I'm writing about narcissistic personality disorder. I'm writing about narcissistic abuse and recovery on my blog. And what I didn't know at the time is that I was actually writing about it all along. I just didn't know what it was called. I sort of instinctively went no contact uh, without even understanding what that concept was. I just knew I wasn't having that person in my life anymore uh, (laughs) because it involved my children, what what this person had done. Um, So I noticed that every time I'd write about it on my blog and every time I would publish anything regarding narcissistic uh, personality disorder or narcissistic abuse and recovery, I got a lot of... um, a lot more hits than usual. I was watching the analytics, nerd. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I, know, I noticed that people started to reach out to me and say, can you help me? I, I see that you understand this concept and you, you know what I've been through and can you help me? And at first I was like, not really. I don't really know how to help other people. I'm still dealing with it. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. as I worked through my healing, I, um, I decided I was going to get certified as a life coach because I, I had been through a lot of, you know, different things. And I'd written a few books about it by this time based on the research and my own experiences kind of meshed together. And um, then, then shortly after that, I started my YouTube channel and well, here I am today. (laughs) So that's very cool. Yeah. So I'm just curious because this is something that I struggle with. I have, um, you know, a handful of personality disordered people in my family. Mm -hmm. How, or do you even try to keep that stuff separate? Like, how do you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, is it as awkward for you as it is for me <laughs> with, with trying to not have family come across some stuff or? It's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Um, you know, and I, I find myself looking around the world and going, oh, there's somebody with histrionic personality disorder over there. There's somebody with this. Or, but I try not to, like, I try not to focus on that stuff when it comes to my friends or my family that, that's close to me. I, I try to not be... Angie Atkinson. <laughs> right, right. You know, I totally get it. Do they do they know about your blog? They do. I don't know for sure how much the narcissist in my life knows, but I do know that uh, she does not. It, it, as far as I know, I don't think she reads it or looks into it. As far as my ex, I have no idea. I don't speak to him at all. So, and I don't speak to my family narcissist either. But I'm certain that she may be aware and not happy at all. But. You got to do what you got to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So kind of uh, switching track here. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Yes. It's a hard day for a lot of people out there. It's probably outside of Christmas, probably the number one Hoover day of the year. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are you guys doing it? Are you doing anything on your channel? 
I am. I'm doing a live stream in the morning, um, and tonight I'll have a video going up around 7 p.m. Okay. Uh, that will be a Valentine's special because I know some people watch them in the evening, some people watch in the mornings, um, and then I will. So the live stream will be around 10 a.m. Central Time, um, and then the video tonight will go up at seven. There will be another video tomorrow night, but it's going to be, you know, maybe not as related directly to Valentine's Day. So, okay, good deal. Yeah. And what time is your live stream tomorrow? 10 a.m. Central Time. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So if you guys are looking for some support or just a place to hang out, 10 a.m. Central Time, Angie's channel. And again, we'll have links below. Yes. Okay. And as far as the hoovering, that's probably going to happen tomorrow and probably all of those feelings of like nostalgia and wishful thinking and all of that stuff that tends to get brought up with holidays. Do you have any pointers for people as far as what you would recommend to help them resist reopening contact? Yes couple of things okay. and at, first of all I, I definitely am covering this in more detail in this video that is going up tonight oh, but, good. okay yeah but I do want to just really quick um, write down all the reasons that you're not with that person even if they left you write down all the reasons you don't want to go back write down exactly how it felt to be with them so that when you're in those weak moments you can pull that out of the door and go oh yeah I don't want to be with this person right mm -hmm. and and also you know don't don't let holiday feelings and, and you know, the, don't let your empath side out too much when it comes to this, you know. It's yeah. really easy to fall for the tears. It's really easy to, to want it to be different than it is. But the fact of the matter is, in my experience, and I think in your experience from what you said on my channel and Richard's experience, Richard Grannon, everybody that I've ever spoken to about this who knows anything about this has never seen anyone change for real in, of a narcissist. I mean, so if somebody comes to you tomorrow and they go, oh, I've always loved you. You're the only one. And you know that person's a narcissist. Don't fall for it. Try to avoid them even getting close enough to you to breathe on you. Yeah, I agree completely. Absolutely. Okay. So let's see. Oh, and so back to what you're saying real quick about the life coaching and all of this. So I, what I've kind of noticed in all of this is that every single speaker, and I think this is so cool. I think every single speaker has kind of their own focus yeah. with this stuff. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your focus, at least where you, you are currently? Because it'll, I mean, it'll, well, it'll change as we grow and change, right? But Certainly. Like today, yeah. where are you? This is a great question, and I'm going to be really honest with you, Dana. I I had to think about this because I thought, what do you mean? I talk about narcissistic abuse, but right, <laughs> you know, and, and recovery and all that stuff. But I thought about it, and I really think here's what it comes down to. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a nerd, and mm -hmm. and so as a nerd, I see things in a very uh, sometimes I even though I'm very emotional by nature, I think be, being an intelligent person. I, I find that logic comforts me, science comforts me. And so I'm very scientific about the way I look at things. Sort of, I'm sorry if you hear this meowing in the background, this is my cat. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm very scientific about the way I see stuff. And I'm all about helping my fellow smart people. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so in fact, on my, on, on my channel banner, it says something about um, narcissistic abuse recovery for smart people, because that's the way that I kind of, you know, roll. But um, I developed a method called the Duo Method. And so that's discover, understand, overcome. It works for literally anything in your life, my life anyway. Uh, but in reference to narcissistic abuse and recovery, it, it requires that you first discover or recognize that you're being abused. Because how many of us have one day... <laughs> I one day stood up and went, wait a minute, I'm being abused? What? I had no mm -hmm. idea. Now, I knew when I was a child because there was physical stuff involved, right? But, but during my marriage, I had no clue that this was abuse. I didn't know. I just thought I was a really terrible person and I deserved it somehow. I'll, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. But it does require that you discover the problem. So that's the first step of the duo method. And then understanding it on a logical and a on an intellectual level is really, really important. And... Um, and I think then to be able to overcome it, you know, that, that really helps me. Knowledge, power, you know what I'm saying? The same thing. Uh, it, it helps me. And I think a lot of the people in my, you know, tribe, to, they feel that way. They, they feel like, you know, knowledge is, empower, is power. And knowing exactly why something is working this way or exactly why something is happening is huge. It's, 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 it's like people say to me sometimes, you know, 
were you listening in my kitchen window or something? Because it sounds like you know exactly what happens in my life. That's very validating. We are not validated as individuals by narcissists. And so we can talk about that later, but it's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a lot of it. But so, you know, and then part of the overcoming phase, of course, is, is what I think is the most important part of healing, of course, is unconditional self-acceptance, which leads to unconditional self-love. So I guess my point is that I help anyone who needs help, but I, I, I want to help intelligent people who think they should have known better in the first place. Um, I tend to lean toward, you know, my, my people tend to be empaths. And I really, I, I, the content I produce is the content that I could have used that I couldn't find when I was going through it. And to be fair, I've been out of it 15, well, I've been out of that marriage 15 years. I've been out of that other relationship with the parental type for only about four years. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I couldn't know five years, but I couldn't find certain material that I wanted and needed um, in the way that I needed to consume it. So I created it. <laughs> so does that answer it all? That answers it completely. And I, okay. and I agree with you completely. It's really difficult, you know, when a person is so lost in that fog of confusion and manipulation, yeah. they don't, they might not realize that there's a problem. And it's sometimes it's just hearing those, a word like gaslighting or projection yes. or um, sociopath or something like that. And they're like, wait, what? And then it starts them down kind of following that white rabbit, you know, like Alice in Wonderland. And then yes. you're like, oh my God, everything starts to make sense. Yeah. But it's got, a, that's that first spark of, it's not you and you're not crazy. And right. that's such a hard place for people to get to. And like you said, you know, you were out of it for 15 years and then for another four, but you know, it's really difficult to put those pieces together. And then I, I'm so, I'm so hundred percent with you because then when you're on the other side of it and you have connected those dots and you look back and you're like, man, the way that this stuff is presented in therapy, especially because I remember when I was in therapy, I'm like, I felt like I was following Moses through the desert. I'm like, I don't want to, you're like, maybe I miss, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not connecting these dots, but there didn't seem to be a, any plan. There was no awareness. I really needed somebody to just be like, let's, to connect those dots. And I needed to hear that vocabulary. And so I love your structured approach of, um, how did you, you said duo, the Discover, understand, overcome. I love it. I yeah. love, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. And that is so huge. Cause like you said, so many people are like, I didn't know I was in an abusive relationship or if I did know I was being abused, I thought I deserved it because narcissists can be so convincing and they're, they just project all their garbage onto us. And yeah, it's awful. It's awful. And it's crazy making and it's yeah. Ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Let's see. So moving on to childhood wounds, you'd mentioned that you had a parental figure in your life who was a narcissist kind of knowing what you know now, of course, hindsight's, you know, such a gift and a curse all at the same yeah. time, right? But knowing what you know now, looking back, what are some of those, talk a little bit about childhood wounds and kind of what you've figured out in your own life and what are some pointers you can give to other people? Because I see a lot of people are like, okay, I've heard about this inner child work mm -hmm. and these childhood wounds, but how do I even begin with this stuff? Yeah. Well, you know, Obviously, being raised by a narcissist will do a real number on your self-worth. <laughs> uh, so growing up, I didn't think, but I knew that I was not good enough and that I could not be good enough. I knew it. Knew it. And I literally felt like my, my thoughts, my feelings, my beliefs weren't real. They weren't worth as much as other people's. Um, and, you know, my grief, my, my sadness, my upset was blown off. Uh, and I, so I was taught that my feelings didn't matter and my and nothing mattered. Um, and when I did achieve something, it felt hollow. Um, so I think I, I think I had developed a big case of imposter syndrome. And I think that's more common with children of narcissists than a lot of people realize. Um, and so I literally felt like I wasn't real. I wasn't as real as other people. And that was a really direct uh, result of the way I was, you know, parented. Um, so no self-actualization to begin with. I, I didn't even know who I was. I knew I was smart. Um, and that was the one thing I had to hold on to is that I could, uh, I could understand people better than people knew I could. Mm -hmm. And that helped me. 
Um, in fact, I, I used to think that the reason I understood people so well is because I, I needed to understand them to know when I was going to be physically punished. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? So yeah. oh, anyway, very little self-actualization. Okay. So I knew that, you know, as I was getting older, something wasn't quite right about the way I was raised. I knew I didn't want to raise my kids that way, but I didn't know exactly what it was uh, outside of the physical stuff. So uh, basically I was like, well, most of it was my fault, you know? <laughs> so mm -hmm. when I first met my ex-husband, my primary narcissist, well, I, I sort of, my, my, she took an, uh, a liking to him. She and, I, and my primary being my parental narcissist mm -hmm. took a liking to him, which, which even though I wasn't liking him that much, she sort of made me feel like I should, because if I could please her, you know, then, then I could do something positive. I thought, uh, because I was not good at pleasing her, <laughs> of course, because I'm not, you know, I'm human. It turns out, so. <laughs> So um, I married him very fast. She didn't like that I did that. She then hated him. But then I was already married to him, so there I was. So um, the other thing is I thought he was the polar opposite of what he was or, or of what she was, but he was just a different type of narcissist. Um, mm. So I guess, I guess when it comes to healing, you know, the childhood wounds of it all, um, I think that my biggest – I think my biggest um, – healing tip there would be to and I, and I, to ask yourself you know as you're as you're an adult now right mm -hmm. um if you have a child in your life whether it's your own child or some other you know niece or nephew or friend that you love or a younger person in your life or anyone that you care about your best friend whatever mm -hmm. ask yourself what would i say to this person if they were my child or if, if they were in the same boat as me right now. So like if you're in a relationship with a narcissist and you look at your lover or your partner or whatever, and you see, okay, this person calls me names. This person doesn't care about how I feel. This person gaslights me and psychologically torments me or whatever. You know, if your child came to you and said, mom, let me say, you know, mom, this person is yelling at me all the time or they're, they're ignoring me all the time or whatever the thing is. Imagine if someone you loved came to you and told you the same thing and, and I want you to like say it out loud to yourself in words, right? Then how would you respond to that person? You know, would you, would you tell your child if, you, if your child was like, you know, hey, hey mom, or if your friend's child, if you don't have children, it was like, hey, Aunt Dana, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, how would you – what, what should I do when this person treats me this way? How should I, you know, this person is ignoring me all the time or they're beating me up or you know, mentally or whatever, you know, how would you respond to that person? Your response is going to be a lot different than it would be if you were talking to yourself in that, in the depth of abuse, because you're going to go, Oh my gosh, you have to get away from that person, you know? Nice. Uh, so I think that's really helpful. I don't know. Did I answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah, you did. <laughs> okay. Um, I, and I'm curious too, did you have a moment as you were moving forward in your healing where, like you said, you started off with this parental figure in your life and you're like, okay, hands down, I knew that that was abuse. Mm -hmm. Then you married somebody, you're like, okay, this is another form of abuse, but it was flying under my radar. As you kind of moved forward, did you start realizing, man, okay, there's been quite, actually quite a few people significant people in my life that have all just been just different types of emotional manipulators. Mm -hmm. And have you been, do you feel that kind of where you are now that you've been able to, to break that cycle? I think so. Um, I think that it's, I didn't have standards like I do now. Now I yeah. just, I do not play like I give people this much, <laughs> no more, no more give an inch, take a mile. I give an inch and if they try to take a mile, I'm out. You know what I mean? I, I require, yeah. because I respect myself now. I didn't before. Not in, not like I should have. I didn't understand what self-respect was on, on this level before. Very well said. I can agree and relate a hundred percent to that. And it's so shocking, you know, like when you look back and you, like you said, that inner child in us, like you just want to go give her a hug and just be like, I am so sorry, honey, that I ever thought that that was okay for you to be treated like that or to be put in situations because it's so not. Totally. And I, I almost cried when you said that because I'm totally with you on that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and 
the whole give an inch, you know, to letting people take a mile. And that really does take a lot of practice to reel that in. This is probably something that you've noticed. I'm sure being a life coach and all this is, um, and I get this question all the time on my channel too, with people struggling with guilt when they start developing those boundaries and like starting to rein it in and they, they're like, I feel so bad and guilty. And, um, Oh yeah. Did you, is this something that you struggled with? And if so, how did you kind of move past that? I definitely struggled with that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the guilt factor, um, because you know, I, I went no contact with my own other, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and that was not done. You know, I, I was brought up to think, you know, if, if you, if you don't do what I want you to do and, and, you know, be a good girl, and this continued into adulthood, then, then you'll lose me. And then if you, if you become homeless or, or something horrible happens, you, you need somebody to pick you up, I won't be there. And then I thought about that. And I thought, you know, as, as I was going through my healing and realizing what I was dealing with, and I finally had gone no contact, I realized that, yeah, there were some times in my life that she did help me for sure. For sure. Always uh, with, with strings. Always, always with strings. I, you knew that if you were getting helped by this person, there would be strings. And that continues today from the grapevine, I hear. Uh, but not for me. <laughs> um, but what it all came down to was ultimately that, that you know, past a certain age in my life, I, I pretty much did the thing on my own. And regardless of anything else, I knew that I was capable. So that helped. Um, I think I lost my, my track, uh, train of thought on that a little bit. I want to make sure I'm sticking to your question. And so repeat it for me one more time. I'm so sorry. Oh, we were just talking about um, struggling with guilt and kind of oh. how, to, how to make healthy decisions despite feeling guilty, I guess. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah. I didn't, <laughs> didn't want to mess that up. Okay. So, so I think what it came down to was uh, recognizing that I had to choose between my own peace and happiness and theirs. And when I could see that, you know, that sounds really selfish to say that, but it's not because there are lots of people in your life who will happily be happy next to you. And then there are narcissists who will intentionally make you miserable and then not even be happy themselves, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So it, it was for their own pacification or, or satiation or my own happiness, I could choose uh, and not just happiness, peace, peace. You know, that's something that I, it was not a thing for me, peace, real peace. It was not a thing. Um, and until, until I could clear the toxic people from my life and I felt this, oh, wow, I felt this lightness, you know, uh, literally like a weight off my shoulders almost immediately. And a lot of people say, well, I don't feel that I have guilt. And that was true. I had guilt also, but, but the, the lightness came from no longer asking myself every single time I made a decision, uh, what is she going to think about this? How is she going to react to this? Is my mm -hmm. mom going to be mad at me for doing this as a 30 year old adult or whatever? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was a big thing for me. So I think yeah. you have to love yourself enough to have standards. And, and unfortunately, just because somebody is related to you by blood or law, that doesn't give them the right, the right to abuse you ever. And that's where I think, you know, and especially, you know, when you're an adult, they, even as a child, of course, of course, but I mean, as an adult, they owe you a certain amount of respect and I could not get that no matter what I did. So I, I had to give it to myself, I guess. Yeah. Fantastic answer. I, yeah, I agree. Um, so was there a moment either with your ex-husband or with your mother or both that you knew that you needed to leave and just never go back? Like what, what was that straw that kind of broke the proverbial camel's back? Ironically enough, uh, both straws were related to my children, unfortunately. Um, the first time, you know, with, with and, and uh, strangely enough, I was with the husband a lot shorter of a time than I was with the mother, but, but the husband, and I didn't ever move back home once I was out at 18, but, but just being connected and enmeshed, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, but with the, the, I left the husband first, so I stayed a lot longer than I should have, um, which I think we all do. I didn't think that I was worth anything and maybe I thought I couldn't do any better. I don't really know, but when my son was born, my first son, who was the only one with that person, um, like I changed, uh, and I and it wasn't about me loving myself more. I did not. Uh, it was about the kid. Like here was this amazing little person I was in charge of, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I had to you know help him become a person. And and I realized that 
my ex-husband, his only deal was, uh, look what I made. I made this kid with her. She see my kid and then we'd get home and he'd have nothing to do with the kid. And that was, that was terrible, but I was willing to deal with that. But uh, I caught him doing something really inappropriate in front of my child, just um, a few feet away from him in the same room while I was in the house. I was just, a, I had taken a nap in the other room or something. And that was the, that was the straw for that one. Mm -hmm. The other one, uh, this is a horrible story, <laughs> but uh you know, back to the whole kid deal, right? So this, my, this person, to make a long story short, falsely accused me of abusing my children, uh, called CPS, not abusing, neglecting, called CPS on me, didn't tell me, they showed up at my door. Um, I brought him in the house. I let him talk to the kids. I let him look at all the things in the house and the case was closed. Wow. They said, yeah, they said, don't worry about it. Sometimes it's just, you know, people do this for revenge on each other. La la la. I didn't believe anything. I, I couldn't believe that it was her. I didn't believe it until I, um, I asked the social worker, could I please read the report that was called in? And she said, well, normally I wouldn't do this, but since we obviously see that there's not a problem here, sure. So she let me read it. And you know how people have certain words they use all the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. I saw those words and I knew instantly that it was her. Wow. So I called her and I said, lots of cuss words, never speak to me again. She screamed at me to um, call my brother, which was irrelevant. And, and, and I haven't really had any major contact with her since. So mm -hmm. yeah, long story. But what it came down to, yes, there was a moment. Yes, it was devastating in both cases. Um, they were four years apart, those moments. Mm, more than that. No, more than that. Um, let me think. Well, one of them was in 98, and one of them was in, I think, 2012, I think. So that seems okay. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, those are two very valid reasons for cutting contact, for sure. Yeah, but I I, I want to say something, if you don't mind. I want to say that sure. if, if you are in a situation where you know you're dealing with a narcissist, don't let them um, make you wait until something horrible happens because that's devastating and scary. And if you know for sure you're dealing with a narcissist, just know that it will happen if you don't get out soon. You know what I mean? Something terrible. Yeah. Well, don't make it be something terrible that makes you leave. Make it be yourself and your, and your safety and your happiness and your peace. Go on, Dana. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Actually, thank you for saying that because that yeah. is such solid advice. And I think so often, you know, it's like that whole analogy of, uh, you know, an abusive relationship is like boiling a frog and mm. that, that water just gets warmer and warmer and then the frog doesn't realize it until it's too late. And yeah. it's so easy for crazy to become the new normal yes. and then all of a sudden boom you're in danger or boom you know your children are showing signs that they're being molested or boom like major stuff and you're like whoa how did I get here and so I agree like you said just kind of if it's a problem now it's going to continue to be a problem these people they really don't change they tend to get worse yeah. with time they learn to hide it better over time they destroy lives mm -hmm. and um you know, you guys, you know, you matter, your children matter and get yourself to safety. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. So let me see. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> um, let's see. Okay. Uh, what have been some aha moments you've had during your healing that you would say have been game changers for you? And however you want to answer that. That's okay. Kind of okay. I got a couple for you, I think. Okay. I think one of them was shocking to me. And that was that I could not believe that I didn't know. Okay. I didn't believe everything I thought I believed. Okay. okay. So after I went no contact uh, with the, the primary narcissist, I started to recognize a lot of thoughts in my head that weren't really my own thoughts. For example, I was at the grocery store one day. I don't know if you've heard me tell this before, if you have stopped me. Mm -hmm. um, but I was at the grocery store one day and this lady was checking me out, an older lady. She was real sweet. She handed me my, here's your change, honey. And I was like, what do you mean, honey? I didn't say that. I loudly thought to my, I bristled. And I was like, mm, I don't like when people call me honey. And then I thought, why do, why do I not like it? That's kind of nice. She was being sweet. She's just a whole thing. You know what I mean? Why does it yeah. matter? And um, then I remembered, like, this flashback. I was uh, 10 years old, standing in front of the dishwasher. I don't know why I remember that, but I do. And, uh, there was my mother standing next to me telling me, I don't like it when people call me sweetie or baby or honey, because that makes me feel like, you know, they think I'm less than them. Okay. 
and and the reason I believe in hindsight that she felt that way was because she was a very young mother um, and people always, you know, we're, we're not tall people <laughs> and mm-hmm. pe- people always, <laughs> you know, would kind of, she felt, she felt, I didn't experience that. She felt looked down upon by the older parents. So she always tried to pretend like she was older than she was. Um, and I think that's what it came down to. Mm-hmm. Now, in that moment, I thought to myself, does it bother me if people call me baby or sweetie or honey? No. Nah. It doesn't bother me. Just call me. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. And and I guess that was um, that that led to a bunch of breakthroughs just like that, where all of a sudden all of these thoughts that I had thought, all of these beliefs that I thought these were my thoughts and beliefs, I had to reexamine literally mm-hmm. everything I knew to be true. That was huge, uh, and it 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 took me. <laughs> You know, I'm probably still doing it, but but it, for for six six to eight months, it was constant, constant. So I guess the breakthrough then was that I could choose my own perception, and I should choose my own percep- perception, and that by doing that, eventually I would realize I could change my life in some really huge ways. So I think that was the biggest one. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. I think, and you're right. You know, when you start waking up from all of this, it's like you have to really go back and just question everything. Yes, and. And frankly, I think even if a person hasn't been through abuse, I think that's a big part of just becoming a self-actualized adult because we're all programmed with religion and school and, you know, culture and nationality and all of these different things. And by the time you hit a certain age, you're like, wait a minute, who am I? I've been on autopilot all these years. And, you know, and then you start stripping away all these beliefs and you're like, do I really believe that? Or is it just because my family believes this or because my gender believes this or my culture or whoever yes. it's weird when you start but it's cool but it's, it's cool but it's weird yes <laughs> i agree <laughs> totally uh let's see okay self-esteem so you had talked about earlier that you really struggled with self-esteem and that you felt hollow and you just kind of had these early beliefs that basically other people could do stuff but it just wasn't for you yeah um I, and that's something i've struggled with my whole life as well how, what are, what are some things that you did to kind of develop a more empowered belief system? And um, yeah, I guess just talk about that. Okay. So I think one of the biggest things for me was, like I said, I I, I think I really had that imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Where I just kind of thought I was like a fake person. And not that I really acted fake. I acted just like myself, but I didn't really know exactly what myself was. Um, And I didn't know, like, okay, here's a a perfect example of me embracing me. Okay. Um, Right there, that, that, pink blingy crap in the background. <laughs> pink totally, awesomeness. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. That's totally me. But but for many years I was, you know, I was, oh, you can't do pink things in the professional world and you can't be girly and wear nail polish and do crazy things to your hair and your face. You can't do those things because, you know, that's that's what dumb girls do. Or that's, you know, mm. <sighs> whatever. And, and so as I guess, I don't know, as someone who was, you know, I was like, I was in the gifted classes and all that crap. I was supposed to be the smart girl. And so, well, I wanted to do the, this cat, I swear. I wanted to do the pink thing and the fun thing and the the being myself thing. And so that was hard for me to, uh, I spent a lot of time, you know, denying all of those things that I loved. And so I think, and that's a silly thing, right, to, to talk about pink. But I guess my point is, and I'll, and I'll get a little deeper for you, but I, I guess the thing is that we have to learn to love and accept ourselves unconditionally, unconditionally in any given moment. I don't think we even know what that means, unconditionally. Yeah, unless, I would agree. You know, and growing up, I didn't know. A lot of children are blessed and they get unconditional love from their parents. Children of narcissists do not do not. And, and no one else in our lifetime ever, ever loves us unconditionally. And you can't expect anyone to do that because you could do something that could, you know, even if you're married to the best person in the world, you know, if you did one of their deal breakers, you know, they mm-hmm. dump your ass and then they don't love you anymore, or whatever. So sorry for saying that word. Uh, so mm-hmm. my point is we spend so much time being invalidated by the narcissists in our lives. uh, And we don't understand love and acceptance. We don't know what unconditional means. And if we're lucky enough to choose, or or should I say unlucky enough to choose narcissists, then they totally use that against us in the most horrible ways, right? So I think we have to learn how to self-validate. And and so by recognizing, okay, there are some things about me that aren't perfect. There are some things about me that maybe I want to change, 
but I'm going to love myself anyway. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to think back to your, your kid or your best friend or the person that you care about the most in the world. You know, they're probably not perfect. And, and, you know, there's somebody in your life or, that you care about to the point that even though they're not perfect, you still love all those things. You know, you don't care if that person, you know, has a weird nostril or if they're a little cranky in the morning, you still love them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you have to be that way with yourself. So, you know, I don't care that I have a weird C-section scar on my stomach and, and that I'm not perfect and that I could still lose a few more pounds and that I could, you know, my hair's crazy and stupid and frizzy. I don't care about those things. I'm okay with it. That's who I am. And so it's, 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 it's understanding what's not perfect about yourself and being okay with that and loving yourself anyway. It's unconditionally accepting yourself. And once we do that, then we can decide what it is about ourselves that we want to change what can, I can't get taller, but I can wear big shoes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, what we can change. And then, and then we can make allowances for those things we can't or won't change about ourselves like we would for someone else that we love. And I really think if you can do that, if you can find it within yourself, if you're not sure, do the kid test or the friend test where you imagine someone you love saying the same thing to you, what would you say to them? You know, um, that that changes things, you know, so like, for example, uh, because of CPTSD and all that crap, I, I need to be alone at least an hour a day with nobody speaking to me at all. Mm -hmm. I just do. And, and I could change that if I wanted to, but I'm not because it's self care, you know? So I'm like, everybody at this hour and this time, don't come in here. Don't do my thing. This is my, my time. Now I try to do that when people aren't home, if I can, but if I can't, Hey, <laughs> mm -hmm. it's okay. I make that allowance for myself. And that is what I think we all as survivors, we all need to do that. We need to make that allowance and we need to go, all right, well, I'm not a great cook, so I'm going to be okay with ordering HelloFresh for a while because it'll be how to cook or whatever. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So that's what I think. Yeah. I, no, I think that's <laughs> I think I think that's great. I think that's yeah. great. And I think you're so right on. It really is about us kind of taking that honest inventory of ourselves yeah. and being like, hey, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Mm -hmm. And what do I want to work on? And, not, and just because something's a weakness doesn't mean that I have to work on it. Right. You know, right. like you're like, okay, HelloFresh is my new like best friend. So yeah, that's going to be how, you know, I, yeah, there are so many things, man, I tell you, I spent so much of my life thinking, okay, I need to get better, you know, with math or with certain other things. And it's just, it was such an uphill struggle. And now with, you know, trying to, cause I write books too and do all this stuff and juggle all these finances. And figuring out other people that are much better at that than I am that can track all that is just a game changer. Like I don't need, yes. you know, like I just need to girl, not be my own worst enemy. Yes, yes. Yes. And just get out of my own way. Yes. Yes. Actually, and that's really, and can I just say this if, in case you have entrepreneurs watching, yeah. <laughs> recognizing that for me and my business was a game changer too. This is similar. To yes. Different, Cause I, I hired, I tried to hire a couple of three different people that didn't work out as well. When I finally found the perfect person for my business. Now this is what she is. She's literally the opposite of me. Like I'm mm -hmm. creative and crazy and all over the place. And she's organized and focused and likes to stick to the program. So it's, it's exactly what I need. She does all the things I hate doing. <laughs> yeah. Know? All the things that I want to do, but that's exactly right. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. Recognizing. And in addition to recognizing your limits, I just have to say this. Yes. Recognizing your strengths and embracing them. Because if mm -hmm. I wasn't doing that, you know what I mean? We wouldn't be here right now. You know what I'm saying? Because that's how yeah. it is. That's, a, you know, I heard this quote a while back and I forget who said it, but it was, it just, and this was like 20 years ago when I heard this and it just really stuck with me, but it was something along the lines of, I pity the person who knows more about their weaknesses than their strengths. Yes. And I thought that's so true because it's so easy for us to kind of go through life and we see everything. We, most people, I think, you know, we have kind of that negativity bias and we see everything that's wrong with us. And, and, but then kind of reframing that and saying, okay, well, what do I have in my corner? You know? Yes. And there's, there's always at least a solid 20 or 30 things that we've got going that are strengths yeah. and you mentioned this was interesting that you mentioned this in our in our interview over there you mentioned to me the albert einstein quote that i've been living my life by for like the last 15 years 
you know, if you teach a fish or if you, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing it's stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the bottom line truth. Everybody has a genius, whatever it is. And, and some people, their genius is putting some stuff together with wood and carving that stuff or whatever people are into or cooking or baking or sewing or all those things I don't like to do, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but I'm not good at those things. And so instead of like expecting saying, I'm not good enough because I don't organize well, or because I don't, you know, do appointment things at, at, you know, whatever Molina does for me. Well, Mm -hmm. she does those things and that's her genius. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And my genius is over here. So when we work together, we create this beautiful thing. And I think that is exactly what we all have to go. That's what I mean by un- unconditional self-acceptance. Just like you would, ex- if, if this were, mm-hmm. you know, Dana, if you and I were sisters and, and you were good at, you know, putting the cake in the pan and I was good at mixing the, the cake mix, mm-hmm. we would do it that way because that would make the most sense. You know, I don't know what all yeah. that is about, but you get the idea. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's it's so true. And and I think part of it goes back, this kind of stuff starts in, in elementary school with kids is there's all this pressure to be good at everything. Yes. Like you need to get A's in everything. And then as kids get, start getting older, I mean, most children, I think, frankly, especially the more gifted ones really start showing aptitude in certain areas. Like they're really skilled at being an artist, but maybe they're terrible in science or they're terrible in reading. Mm-hmm. And my brother, perfect example of that. Uh, you know, or they really are interested in, you know, car mechanics, but they just, they couldn't care less about literature. Right. And I think so much of um, parents, you know, parenting and society in general, it's, it's seeing kind of that unique genius in children and, and, and cultivating that, you know, um, instead of so so much of this focus on, well, you have to be really good at everything. Because then as an adult, we still kind of tend to carry those beliefs of, well, we have to just be good at everything. And then we feel guilty when we're we're terrible with bookkeeping or we're terrible with cooking or whatever. And all of that guilt, then for a lot of us that struggle with low self-esteem, it turns into shame. (laughs) Then it's like, we don't even need any of this. Like, it's okay. It's okay to not be good at everything, you know? It is. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, I, I now embrace it like hardcore. I, really do. <laughs> I do. I'm like, that's I'm awesome. just not good at that. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm yeah. good at this other stuff over here. <laughs> so that's what I, it helps. It's, and, it, and when you can love yourself like that, then you win. Because if this were mm-hmm. anyone else in your life, you would be like, oh, well, that's okay. We'll make allowances for you. Why would you not make allowances for yourself? And that's, you know what I mean? I, I think that everybody needs to learn that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I think finding our strengths is so key. And, you know, when people are so fresh out of these relationships and they're, man, I remember, I still vivid, uh, gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Vividly remember being there where you're just feeling so emotionally and financially and physically just blown apart. And you're like, I don't even know how to, you just feel like, um, like you're living in a war zone. You're like, I don't even know how to begin to reassemble my life. Like this, you know, this battle happened or this tornado maybe is a better example. This tornado just blew through here and everything is just a disaster and really learning to turn inward and realize, okay, what, what, what do I have in my corner? Like what strengths do I have in my corner? And that was a, one of the things that really helped me to kind of move forward was, you know, just, you got to dig deep, I think. And true. Know yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is kind of, this is totally a side question. <laughs> and I know we're kind of running long on time here, but um, okay. I am just curious as a YouTuber and kind of struggling with like imposter syndrome and feeling like I don't really know who I am. Did you struggle with that when you started your YouTube channel? Cause I did. <laughs> um, when I, you know, when I first started the, yes, when I first started the channel, I did not even show my face at all, except for like a snapshot in, in one slide or something. Okay. Um, and I was just like, because I don't think I have a camera face. And oh, I, are you kidding me? No, I'm not I kidding. Totally do. Oh my <laughs> gosh, that's crazy. Okay. Well, that's what I thought, and and uh-huh. now I understand, you know, the value of it because I. But I know, yeah. But I, I think I, I think I must have been more over the imposter syndrome than I. By the time I started putting my face on camera, and the only reason I did that was because of the people. The people were like, "Show us your face." Uh-huh. <laughs> 
and they weren't the jerks. They were the, the real people that come and support you. And I am, I get such a significant, and I'm sure you probably experience a similar deal, such a significant amount of validation from my audience and my, you know, my family, my group that my tribe, you know, mm -hmm. here on YouTube, as well as in on Facebook and all the places, because I, you know, people, and I'm sure you hear it too. People tell me all the time, you saved my life. I mean, yeah. I could, I didn't know. And you, you say to me, that makes it all worth it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And what I did, you're going to probably think I'm crazy, but what I did for a long time when I first started is I would do two videos a day and I would do well for a while. And I did a morning video where I would literally be holding my phone like this, blah, 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 talking in my phone, no makeup, <laughs> hair crazy, just woke up mm -hmm. in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I did that because I've, you know, developed this, I, I developed this issue where I can't leave the house without makeup, I can't leave the house without my hair looking perfect, la la la, because long story, I won't go into it right now, but it, there was a reason. And, and so when I would do that, that was me breaking through my own self-esteem issues. So I guess in a way, I kind of used YouTube to grow up a little bit um, in that respect. But then I noticed that my people did like it, but some people didn't like it. Uh, people, newer people who didn't understand why I was doing it, didn't like it as much so I stopped doing it um, but but the people who were with me was doing it I would say that I mean I gained four or five thousand subscribers during that time so it couldn't have been that bad <laughs> yeah and I think it's there's a lot to be said with connecting to a face on the screen and especially with like the live streams and yes and then just and I didn't live back then. I didn't do streams back then but, yeah well that's true that's an, a fairly new yeah. thing but then like just being a real person yes and, it really connects. To yeah. Us. It's so funny that you mentioned the no makeup and all that thing. I had the same realization. This was probably about four years ago. Yeah. I'm like, what is, this is weird. Like if I feel ugly and that I don't want to go outside because my hair and makeup's not done, then there's something wrong. And I threw everything out of my closet, except I decided I'm going to wear 31 things for 31 days. And Ooh. total like clothes for like, I'm talking bras, panties, socks, uh, pajamas were in work clothes, wow. which gave me like three tops, three bottoms. Like it wasn't a lot and I wasn't going to wear any makeup. Oh and gosh. so for a month and I went into work and I told my coworkers, I'm like, y'all are going to see a bunch of repeats because like, I'm wearing, I just need to figure out with my own psychology, like what is going on? And I need to get yeah. comfortable with, without wearing makeup because I don't want to hide behind makeup. I like makeup. It's fun, but I want it yeah. to be fun and not necessary not necessary yeah. yeah so that's interesting that did you did you notice with your youtube channel that people because i think one of the unique things about youtube and it's one of those things too that i don't think unless a person has a youtube channel they're on this side of the camera it's really difficult for them to understand because they perceive us in a certain way mm -hmm. and i think if a person's struggling with self-esteem and they're struggling with you know and i think any creative person like kind of getting your stride, getting, finding your voice with all of this, how they see us and how we see ourselves are two very different things. Did you notice, did you experience that too? Was there kind of a disconnect? And do you feel like it shaped kind of who you are and your message? I think, yeah, up to a point. I mean, I, I felt a disconnect in, you know, I, and I think I've, I think I've come clean. Um, I, I kind of, at first I was like, I wanted people to think that I was totally fine all the time. And, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't want people to think that, that I could possibly have like real serious issues. And, 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 you know, and now I'm pretty straight up with my audience and I, I wasn't lying to them before, but I was not always showing them, um, the bright side or the, the, the ugly side of the bright side, you know, because it yeah. still sucks sometimes to be a person, you know, and stuff, uh, you know, you get sick or, or something doesn't go right in your life and things happen still. So I, I, you know, I, I think I've always been pretty honest with them, but I, I think that I've, well, this is what I know. When I started being more transparent um, and more me and stopped trying to be like, I'm so professional <laughs> and started just being like, okay, this is who I am, you guys, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I think they were fine with it. I, I recognized that if I'm going to help people like me, I have to be real. And, and those are the people, if we're being honest, Dana, the reason we're having such an easy conversation here is because we're similar people. We have yeah. something in common. And a lot of it, everybody who's been 
through what we've been through, there's something they're going to identify with. Some of them won't like me because of the pink and the sparkly crap and the silliness. And some of them, you know, might not like, I don't know, other people who are more serious or who are more, sure. you know, sad. There's, I know some YouTubers that do this are kind of like real sad all the time. And, mm -hmm. but some people don't like the fact that I'm the opposite of that. When I'm talking, I, I, you know, <laughs> I just say what I think and I'm real about it. And I, sometimes I have a little more humor than they would enjoy, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm fine with that. It's just how I roll. So it's, it, to me, I don't know if I'm answering your question correctly. If I'm not, please clarify it for me so I know. <laughs> oh, there is no correct. I, I was just kind of wondering that what you're saying, that was so much my experience too. Like I really struggled with, like when I first began making videos, I was coming across as kind of a domestic violence advocate, which is what I used to do. And then, yeah, it just takes a little while to kind of find your voice. And then I started like, oh, no, I'm just me. I'm a woman on this journey trying to figure it out. And yeah. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's just, in, it's just interesting. And then people will give comments and you're like, man, really? Like you think I come across like that or, uh, I'm either insulted or I'm flattered. Like it just depends on what the comment, but it's, yeah. it's just very, it's a very interesting place when you're trying to find yourself as a person mm -hmm. and then to put yourself out there. And now you have a bunch of, uh, feedback and it's a, on a huge spectrum and it's, I don't know. I was just, I was just curious if anybody else has struggled with that. I want to add something because now that now I understand a little better what you're saying. I've had people tell me, um, eating tips. Uh -huh. I've had people tell me, um, you know, uh, maybe you should just, uh, you know, I've had people tell me I produce too much content. I should take better care of myself. Um, I've had people tell me that, if I stop doing my live streams in the mornings, that well, well, lots of things, lots of things, and and I, I've had people be very rude, very, very, very rude to me, um, and this is how we deal with it. Watch this, interesting, <laughs> 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 because I just I look at it as um, I I have this bubble, you know, this this is my positive bubble. Stay out of it. You know what I mean? Like it just bounces right off, baby. <laughs> Yeah. That's right off. That's how I see it. Yeah. Well, and I think, that, you know, once a person gets more grounded in themselves, in your decisions, like you don't need that validation from other people. And for me, that's been one of the coolest things about, about this whole process is I didn't realize how easy I, I was in the past to get knocked off center. Yes. I mean, it only took like one comment and all of a sudden I was not living in my truth. I was living in somebody else's truth or what they yeah. thought my truth should be. And, yeah. and yeah, you really do start realizing, okay, what do I think about this? What do I feel about this? Like, what, what does work for me? You know, like, yes. am I taking action from a place of, of like the whole like fear, obligation and guilt? Or am I taking action from a place of like, no, actually I'm good. Like, this is what I really want to do. And, um, it's cool when you can really just get firmly rooted in yourself because then, yeah, like people can make comments like that and you're like, yeah, it's, it's Bounce off. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I did, uh, this is hilarious. Actually. I made one video, uh, call, and I, I think it's called something about to my haters or something like that. And here's the video. I, I don't remember, but, mm -hmm. uh, anyway, it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> because I literally, I'd gotten to this point and I, I'm still there where I just, I read this comment. It was so nasty and mean that I literally LOL. I laughed out loud. <laughs> uh -huh. And I was like, I cannot believe this person would write this. It's so awful. So awful. I mean, it's awful. And I was like, so I could sit here and I could cry about it. Or I could be like, a psh, no. So you know what I did? I made a video and I very, very calmly explained why I enjoyed that comment so much. It was fabulous. It felt really good. And everybody liked it. So <laughs> it was yeah. fine. Uh, but it helped me and I, I would have put it up even if people didn't like, I've never done it since and I never will again. And I said it in the video, this is the last time I'm ever going to do this. If I need to refer, I don't even acknowledge those comments anymore. I just delete them because it, unless they're like legitimate comments, making legitimate points, right. about what I'm saying it's, it's okay to disagree with with me and I will admit if I'm wrong you know what I'm saying like somebody disagreed with something I said about fibromyalgia in a video recently and I said you know what I'm not an expert on fibromyalgia I don't claim to be thank you for sharing your point that's okay with me yeah but, but don't just attack me for no reason and if you're going to okay delete <laughs> right that's how I feel it's just negativity I don't need it in my life so yeah 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 Anywho. <laughs> yes I I agree I agree you know it's funny too kind of a 
YouTube, and it sounds like you've experienced this too, like really in a very kind of trial by fire way can help a person develop resiliency. And man, I tell you, I remember the, I remember those first probably few, well, at least few months that I had my channel up, you know, and you know, you get the dislikes on your videos. It's all part of it, right? Like you get the, the troll comments, you get the people that unsubscribe for any number of reasons. And I remember taking that stuff so personally. And there were some comments I would read that I, my approach to handling stress is I go to bed. Like I just sleep. I have, I have like no, like there's no fight or flight. It's just, I don't, I don't even know what you'd call that. Just pass shut out. Down. Yeah. Just shut, shut down. down. Completely. Yeah. It's debilitating. Yeah. It's awful. And um, I just did not, I was so fragile when I first started. I just had no idea what I was getting into. And it's interesting, you know, kind of looking back on it now and it's like, oh man, what used to just, you know, send me to bed at eight o'clock on a Saturday is nothing now. Like it's just a pebble in my shoe. If even that, like you just yeah. delete and drive on. And yeah. so, and, and okay. Yeah. And, and I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's get back to, <laughs> let's get back to this. All right. Okay. Let's <laughs> talk about your healing. Um, okay. What would you say was the most helpful thing in your healing? And then the least helpful thing in your healing. Okay. Okay. So I think the most helpful thing was first just discovering it and realizing that there was this disorder and that it wasn't me being crazy or lazy or stupid or whatever. And then learning about the psychology of the disorder helped me a lot because then I could see how it would manifest in different people. And then I could look at my own psychology and go, okay, how is this affecting my development as a person? And what you know, what is habit, what parts of me are real and what parts of me are, you know, developed out of desperation or, or, you know, just chance, I guess, or whatever, uh, toxic. And, and then learning about the unconditional love thing that we talked about, self-love, unconditional self-love, unconditional self-acceptance, all important. And then asking myself, like what we talked about, how would you feel if your child came to you and asked this question? How, what would you, what would you say? And then, and this is really the most interesting thing, um, the forgiveness letter, when uh, people who watch my channel might know what I'm talking about, but if, you know, when you get through the parts where you get past the anger and the sadness and all the things, there will come a time, well, okay, maybe not the anger, because there was a time in college uh, when there was a person in my life who was a former roommate, that's all I'm going to say, not, not a romantic partner, male. Uh, long story short, he did some bad stuff. I was very angry. I moved out. And I, I was so angry that I, I got this awesome new apartment. It was so beautiful. Everything was wonderful. I had a good job. Life was good. And yet I sat around being mad all the time. And I couldn't figure out what it was that was making me do this all the time. So I, I'm sitting here one day drinking my coffee. Oh, I don't know why I can't I feel so angry. And, and literally Dana, this voice, and I'm, I'm not crazy, I swear. This voice whispered in my ear. I physically heard it. And it said, audibly heard it, I, I should say. And it said, you have to forgive him but in a whisper that I couldn't quite identify the voice of. And I was like, what? I'm not going to forgive this freak. He did these horrible things to me. And why would I forgive this person? It wasn't about him. It was about me. I was carrying this toxic crap in my, in my head, in my soul, in my energy level, all these things. So how would I forgive someone that I was never going to speak to again? Huh? Well, I started to write him a letter. And in the letter, I said all the things I thought, all the things I felt, all the things that I never got to say because, uh, hello, narcissists don't give us closure, right? Anyway, mm -hmm. so I'm writing this letter saying all these things. And I, I and fully intended to send the letter while I was writing it. And at the end of the letter, I wrote in the last paragraph, I said, um, and now, even though you don't deserve it, I'm going to forgive you because I don't need that toxic crap in my life anymore. Keep your toxic energy to yourself on your own side of the world. Goodbye. I forgive you. And then I, and then I signed it and then I looked at it and then I rewrote it again without all the cuss words. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I was done. I really was going to send it, but I didn't need to send it. Uh, the act of writing it and, and then of editing it, cause again, I'm a huge nerd, um, mm -hmm. really helped me. And so, so, uh, it was an, insane how the relief was after that. So, so I've done that in a couple of other situations in my life. And it really, really changed 
uh, my, my ability to forgive someone because when you get through all the hard parts, the anger eventually becomes toxic to you. Like when you're in the middle of a narcissistic mess, I, I, sometimes you need the anger to propel forward. Yep. So, you know, but then when you're done with it, what are you going to do with it? You have to figure out a way to let go of it. So that forgiveness letter was huge for me. And it was something, it's something I teach my clients today uh, because it was such a big, huge, it worked for me. And it was just literally, I'm not trying to be funny. I literally heard it in my ear. So I can't even claim credit for the idea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, anyway, and the least helpful thing I think was people who didn't understand and who tried to tell me to get over myself. I was being too dramatic. I just needed to move forward and get over it. It doesn't work that way when you've been through narcissistic abuse. Um, you have to figure out, I had to figure out why it happened and, and I think part of the reason it's so painful for us is because there is no closure. There's no end of the line. There's no, okay, this is what happened and this is why. There's none of that stuff. There's just mm -hmm. a bunch of, <laughs> you know, so that was my least helpful thing, I guess. People who didn't understand and who tried, even some of the people who wanted to understand and tried to understand but couldn't, um, unfortunately, that was probably among the most harmful uh, situation. You know, part of it was that, they were trying to help me get over something like a normal person, but I hadn't been in a normal situation. Right. So, yeah. 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 And it's, yeah, there's just, there's so much uh, brainwashing that goes on in these types of relationships and it, it just makes a person completely question their reality. It shakes the person's faith in themselves and in other people. I mean, the, the, damage that's done is just, there's such a huge ripple effect that people, you know, what's that say? Like, oh, you just got to get over it. You got to move on. And it's like, that's such a reductionist approach to it. It's sort of like telling an alcoholic, well, you just need to quit drinking. Yeah. It doesn't or, work like that. No. I mean, like there's obvious, like yeah. there's so much more. I mean, that's right. the tip of the iceberg, but there's so much more going on that yes. that's not addressing. And yeah. So I, 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 I hear you with that. Um, Okay, so what are some positive ways that your life has been changed as you've moved forward in your healing? Okay, so I learned to love and accept myself unconditionally. Mm -hmm. I love I'm it. Pretty much there, yeah. Um, I actually lost 100 pounds. Uh, what? Good for you. <laughs> I did, I did. Uh, and, and, you know, that was something. Uh, that was after I went no contact with the, the, mo the mother. Uh -huh. um, which was ironic and weird, but sure enough, um, it was intentional in case anyone thinks it accidentally fell off. No, no, it was intentional. Um, <laughs> I had a nutritionist on my channel the other day actually say that, Oh, that you got lucky there. I'm like, really? Cause it felt like a lot of hard work to me, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I got remarried. Um, I, you know, I have two more kids, beautiful home, successful career. Um, I get to do what I love every single day and help people make their lives better. Uh, just to name a few, you know, um, I, I really, I can't complain. I, I spend every, I, I think it's really important to be grateful every single day for the good things in your life and to focus on what you want, not what you don't want. And that is what I do. Awesome. Awesome. I'm just curious real quick too. So you've remarried and I know a lot of people struggle with this and this is something I've struggled with too, with dating again is when you found yourself drawn to narcissists before, uh, whether it was been like with friends or roommates or, uh, you know, previous partners, was, I guess, what was the, how was the attraction? How did it feel different between like healthy love and being in love with a narcissist? I was remarried before I knew what a narcissist was. Okay. Um, and I guess I got lucky. Uh, the difference is, is, is us against the world. The difference is, feeling like, look, okay, here's an example. I actually talked about this in a video recently and I'm just going to share it with you really quick. Okay. I, um, my husband and I, you know, gosh, it's not perfect, but, uh, we have similar, um, we're very different. We're two completely different people. There's literally very little we have in common, um, mm -hmm. except our, you know, our, belief systems, I guess. Uh, about, yeah, yeah. You know, but as far as like how to raise children, what we want for our children, that kind of stuff and, and how we want our household to run and things like that. Um, but our, our thing that we're, and, and, and I'm going to be really honest with you, I wouldn't go back and undo what I did, but if I had known then what I know now, I probably wouldn't have married when I did. It was four years after I left my ex. Um, but I, I think I would have, well, no, that's not true. It was four years after that I, that, that I got 
together with him. Okay. Um, but we got married four years after that. Um, so eight years after I left my ex. So I wasn't rushing. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what was wrong with me, but I knew I needed to heal. So I did take plenty of time between relationships. Um, I was a single mom and I had a lot to think about. Um, so I think, I guess my point is that it feels different because I know that even if we're in an argument, even if things aren't perfect, and this is what happened a few years ago, this happened before we moved into this house. Um, we found out that someone in our old neighborhood was spreading a lot of lies and gossip. And um, the moment that I learned this um, on Facebook or something, I went and I, and I went to where he was, even though we had been kind of in an argument, he was in, in his office and downstairs and I was upstairs. And, um, I went downstairs to where he was and I said, uh, like nothing, like whatever our argument was about was over for both of us immediately. You know what I mean? Like I went downstairs, I said, have you, have you seen this? You know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and he was like, no. And then it was over. We weren't even thinking about that. Now it was us against the world. And I think my point is, and that's a silly example, but I think my point is that when you are in a real relationship and you know that it's the real deal, um, it's you against the world no matter what. And not to say that you need to always be against the world, but mm -hmm. whoever it is who, um, this cat, I'm sorry, kitten, shh, shh, shh. I'm sorry, That's okay. um, <laughs> so unprofessional, uh, whoever it is against, you know, it's, it's you against the world. Um, not that it should be you against the world all the time, but it should also, you, knowing that you have a partner, no matter what the state is uh, or the status is in your relationship at that moment. So when you're with a narcissist, uh, chances are they're going to serve you up to the, you know, social media um, de demons or whatever. If, if, if you're not in the right you know, place, they might go in and gossip about you on that thread too, for example, yeah. instead of having your back or whatever, you know, I'm just saying uh, that's a terrible example. I'm sorry. But I guess the difference is that, that no matter what you've got a party there's not a bunch of uh like with a narcissist it was oh my god i'm so in love at the beginning and it was very uh, much infatuation i in hindsight mm -hmm. i know um but it, it was less of that it was less it was more of a uh, not just a logical choice also a, you know a heartfelt choice but certainly a logical choice more so than it ever was with a narcissist um less about um feelings in the moment and more about feelings of long-term understanding. Uh, like I said, it took us oh, several years to get married. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we were together for, no, I guess we were together for almost four when we got married. Um, but it was four years after I left my ex. So yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I had to think about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was my, my oldest son was just four when we met and he was, he was, he must've been, eight when we got married or nine eight or nine when we got married so yeah yeah take your time <laughs> yeah going slow taking yeah. your time I think that's really great advice and I think like you said the difference is is so huge when you're with a narcissist it's like you're playing a supporting role in their life it's all about them all the time and or and or they're you know actively working to destroy you <laughs> uh so like you're playing a supportive role and you're being destroyed at the same time, it's just ridiculous. Um, but then with like the healthy partner, you know, just that level of, of reciprocity and teamwork and sincerity. And it's like, okay, I, I, this is, this is a really nice, comfortable fit here. You know, I like, so I like that. I'm, I'm happy yes. for you. Yeah. It has to be comfortable. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank so, okay. One last question. Actually, before we wrap, before I ask the last question, let people know again real quick, uh, what is your website and in, in, in your YouTube channel name and all that? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. There was a delay a did, second ago. I, okay. Um, did you ask me to repeat how people can find me? Yeah. And then I'll ask you the last question. You said. We'll okay. Call it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, on youtube.com slash Angie Atkinson, um, Facebook, I'm under uh, facebook.com slash coach Angie Atkinson, I think. Uh, Twitter at Angie Atkinson. Um, booksangiewrote.com. Booksangiewrote.com will take you right to my Amazon page. Queenbeing.com is my website and you can find all my other stuff from there. Queenbeing.com. 
Awesome. Okay. And then the last question is, what words of encouragement would you like to pass along to others that are trying to heal? Okay. Now, before I tell you this, I want to tell you that <laughs> this is actually something um, that I, I, I put this, I put this together when I was going through one of the hardest times of my life. Okay. And I, I'm, I'm going to share with you just a little bit of it. It is something, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. It is something that I wrote, um, <laughs> uh, but I want to share it with you. I, I was doing this exercise that um, I found somewhere. What are 10 things that your inner child needed to hear, right? Mm. And because we don't think we're good enough and we don't think our feelings and our thoughts are genuine or relevant to the world a lot of times, and we might feel like a, I did. I felt like a big fake, right, when I tried to follow my dreams or anything like that. So it has to all start within your own head, right? And so I, I have these 10 statements that I'm going to share with you that I think every everybody who's been through narcissistic abuse needs to hear. And it's something that I wrote to myself when I needed to hear it. All right. <laughs> it's short. Don't worry. Go for okay. It. Number one, you are, you are a real person. You have legitimate concerns, feelings, thoughts, aspirations. Number two, you are good enough. Number three, you don't need anyone's approval or endorsement to help you succeed. Nobody has to say it's okay. You can get validation through success and in your own self-dictated endeavors, you know, <laughs> um, it's not about you, the, the abuse, and it's not your fault. You aren't bad and you're not broken. Um, and if you are, you'll get over it, <laughs> mm -hmm. not over it, through it. You're more beautiful in the broken places. Um, you can literally just do uh, literally almost anything that you want to if you just decide to do so. If you choose to do it, you will be compelled to take inspired action and you can make it happen. The only thing I haven't succeeded in yet is getting taller. Okay. <laughs> um, you have, okay. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Um, you have something real to offer the world. You matter. You have value. Uh, you can be exactly what you choose to be and choosing your own identity doesn't make you selfish, lazy, entitled, or otherwise unsavory. You get to choose your own identity every single day. Mm -hmm. You decide who you are. No one else. No one else defines you. You decide and you decide how far you go as a result of that being that person. And you can compromise for someone you love up to a point. But when it's time to choose your priorities and choose a path, compromise means both parties must bend and both parties must be satisfied with the outcome. So it's not compromising to give up what you want in order to make someone else happy or keep them from getting angry with, at you. And finally, one last thing, if you walk away from a toxic relationship, the world's not going to end. It's going to be, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult and, it, and you'll have a lot of soul searching to do, but um, the world will not end. And in fact, your world might actually begin right then. So I love it. That's it. I love it. That's awesome. What a great list. Thank you. Good deal. Well, Angie, thank, thank you, you so much for your time today. It was great getting to chat with you and getting to know you better. And uh, we'll have to do this again at some point. My pleasure. So absolutely. We'll take love. care, you guys. And if you have any questions, if you want me to interview Angie again, if you have any additional questions for her, let me know below in the comments and we will go from there. So take care and thank I'm going to stop recording and then I'll come see you. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Okay.